start to share my screen? Yes, please. So there's the green button at the bottom. Yeah. And then that should open up uh, your desktop. So if you uh, pick, up, pick up your uh, your presentation. Okay. And if I click on that, uh, you should see, well, you should be able to see my uh, uh, thumbnail screen at the moment. Mm -hmm. And there is the uh, the full screen presentation. I hope that everybody's got that. So you... Brilliant. And, I, and, and we are recording this. Okay, so you have the uh, they have the proper screen. Okay, well that's good. Um, so um, as uh, as Ray has uh, intimated already, uh, X Ray Mineral Services, uh, the company was born some uh, long time ago in the uh, mid nineteen nineties. Uh, it is a privatized arm, if you will, of the uh, Robertson Research Organization, which is uh, has famously traded in the uh, Clendidno area for many decades. Um, and is well known in the uh, oil, gas, uh, petroleum sector. Um, specialist groups, uh, which were part of the company, uh, were progressively spat out and uh, X-ray Minerals Services was formed when the uh, Robertson Minerals uh, Group was finally shifted uh, off campus and uh, effectively privatised. Um, we've worked in collaboration with a number of companies over the years. Uh, Chemostrat from Welshpool being one of them. Um, they, of course, are now part of a wider group, which is known as the Haber and Scientific Group. Um, and so we are a, uh, a, a company whose um, shareholding is effectively vested in Haber and Scientific, but we continue to operate essentially independently from our traditional base in uh, Colwyn Bay. Uh, you can see our um, uh, address there. So. Um, I'm going to move on then to the uh, to the first slide um, and and talk to you just for a moment about exactly what I mean when I'm talking about uh, um, X-ray methods in analytical uh, geology. Um, so particularly, it does not include uh, what I will call the tomographic methods, um, where the uh, material density is used as a, as a contrast medium and some sort of exposure is made from the results. So you will be familiar, of course, with uh, medical tomography. Um, perhaps less so, um, there is uh, nowadays a uh, very, very wide field of application for uh, computed tomography, whereby an X-ray beam of um, variable uh, dimensions uh, is actually used to scan through slices of the material um, and operate in 3D to stack up all of those slices and, and recreate the body which is, uh, which is being scanned. So to illustrate the scale on which this uh, operates, I have found you a very, very nice graphic of a spider which has been recovered from uh, amber um, from the Cretaceous. And there is also on the right hand side of the screen, I will try to use my pointer intelligently, um, the um, effective result of scanning at very high resolution, um, a, uh, a porous sandstone, which is part of a, an oil reservoir. Um, these things are, are really rather handy because, of course, you have a 3D computer model. You could actually arrange to fly through the porosity of your sandstone, for example. And in fact, the two views which are presented to you um, give you both the solid part of the material on the uh, left hand side and uh, the integrated uh, porosity on the right hand side of the graphic. So those are X-ray methods, but they are tomographic and they are not uh, analytical. So I am going to talk about X-ray diffraction and I'm going to talk about X-ray fluorescence. Um, so I think the first thing that we should do uh, is to actually talk about uh, what I mean when I'm talking about diffraction and why it differs from uh, the tomographic um, X-ray which we've been looking at uh, just now. So. Um, you should be able to see a, uh, a lovely picture on the left hand side of the screen of the uh, wonderful iridescent patterns um, which have been produced by a uh, fairly large drop of oil 
on a, uh, a wet surface. Um, and you will be familiar with the um, colored um, fringes which arise from that. And this is a manifestation of diffraction. Okay? Um, what is happening is that uh, light from the sun is shining obliquely onto this, uh, this puddle of oil, which is spread out in a very, very thin layer. The particular point being that the thickness of the layer that it has spread out into is uh, comparable with the wavelength of the light which is illuminating it. Um, and uh, colors result from the fact that uh, waves which reach the bottom of the oil film have a different path length from those which are reflected from the top of the oil film. And where the path length is actually an integral number of the wavelengths of the uh, illuminating radiation, then a so-called diffraction effect will occur. Um, now, daylight is, is not the best medium for uh, diffraction studies because of course it has uh, a very variable wavelength. You're familiar, of course, with the idea that waves of uh, red light have a very much longer wavelength than those of blue light. Um, the other thing that I should say is that uh, this, the, the study of these phenomena is, is not new. Um, you can see that I've put on the screen the only mathematical equation that will appear during this uh, presentation, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, the Bragg uh, father and son combination were active at the University of Leeds, which is where I studied uh, coincidentally, um, uh, at the time of the First World War. And in fact, they were given a, uh, a Nobel Prize for correctly uh, determining the structure of the halite or sodium fluoride crystal from X-ray diffraction studies. So the leap, if you like, from, uh, from the oily puddle to uh, looking at uh, molecular structures is quite a large one, but it is governed by exactly the same uh, sort of techniques and constraints. Now, uh, anybody who, who looks um, with magnifying glass or microscope at the surface will know that there is actually a limit to the magnification which can be achieved using optical light, you know, ordinary optical wavelengths. Um, and in fact, if you're trying to look at really, really tiny, tiny, tiny things, then you should look uh, with a very short wavelength radiation. And of course, uh, electron microscopes uh, indicate that the, the electron beam has a wavelength and it is very, very much smaller than the optical wavelengths which are illustrated by our oily puddle. But before we leave the oily puddle, I should just explain the pattern which you can see. Um, sunlight, uh, as you will appreciate, is not monochromatic. It contains a mixture of all um, wavelengths that are uh, visible to our eyes. Um, and of course, there's a confusing factor here as well, because there is no guarantee that the film of oil, which is being visualized, is actually a constant thickness. Um, and so you can actually see colored fringes. Uh, you can count them. There are approximately three which are visible and there would probably be more uh, otherwise. Um, and that brings us rather neatly to the uh, Bragg equation, which I have uh, illustrated on the, uh, on the screen uh, approximately here. Um, and it points out that there is a, um, relationship between the wavelength of uh, incident radiation and the diffraction process where d is the uh, distance between the layers of things which are being illuminated by the uh, the radiation um, d you can see in the little cartoon of the diffraction process it is the the spacing, the layer spacing of the, uh, the structured material. Um, there is also a term N in there, and that accounts for the fact that there are multiple rings in the uh, diffraction pattern from the uh, puddle of oil, because 
you are seeing first, second, and third order reflections uh, from the uh, oil materials. Okay. Um, but if we're going to uh, think seriously about how to use uh, radiation to, dis to look at um, uh, structure of layered materials, then we first of all need to make it uh, monochromatic. Um, and you can see from the shape of that equation that there are actually sort of three variables. There is wavelength, there is distance, and there is this thing called theta, which is the angle of incidence of the, uh, of the radiation. And if you can fix two of those, then the other one can be determined absolutely. So what we'll do is we'll move away from sunlight. We will uh, use a monochromatic uh, source of radiation. Um, and by varying theta, we can invest investigate the different layered structures with different spacings which exist within, uh, within minerals, for example, which have a, a regular and very, very well-defined structure, which is based upon their chemistry. The, the way that you can organize your atoms in, in a structure gives a uniqueness in a crystallographic sense, um, which enables you to uh, describe minerals which are predictable uh, and useful uh, descriptions. We'll move on then. Um, sunlight is easy to capture. Uh, we have a, a range of mysterious uh, machines downstairs, um, two of which I can actually hear making small operating noises in the darkness under my feet downstairs. Um, and they comprise a uh, very, very straightforward uh, X-ray generator uh, with some sort of a detector system. Okay? Um, we have two identical machines, which you can see on the left, and these are rather old fashioned because they have uh, a, uh, an X-ray tube tower here um, and a uh, detector system on the right, which organizes the handling of samples uh, and the recording of the outputs from the diffraction uh, experiments. Uh, the two machines on the right-hand side are uh, fundamentally very similar, but the radiation shielding is outside of the um, uh, tube area so that uh, basically the mechanics of the machine can be sort of neatly hidden in a cabinet and kept clean and, uh, and well ventilated um, and uh, fit for use. The x-rays are produced very simply by uh, firing a beam of uh, electrons at a high accelerating voltage onto a target. Now, People who use um, electron microscopes will be aware that the very electron beam that they are uh, using to illuminate their sample is actually exciting X-rays from the surface of their sample. And that information can be collected and used to give you a chemical fingerprint of the thing which is being illuminated. But the important thing about our setup here is that we are actually seeking so far as possible, simply to produce a nicely collimated monochromatic beam of X-rays, and they illuminate the sample. If I move on to the next slide, we will look at the inside of our most modern machine. Um, it looks something like this. There is the X-ray tube is on the left. The uh, sample stage is right in the center of the, uh, of the uh, graphic. Uh, with a convenient arrow, uh, and the detector system is on the right-hand side of the picture as I'm looking at it. Um, there are in the foreground three stacks of samples waiting to be uh, loaded and, uh, and diffracted. But the, uh, the, the way that the machine is um, uh, arranged in its rest position is a little bit misleading because you can see that the X-ray source on the left-hand side is effectively uh, in exactly a direct line with the detector. Um, and that is not good, but because the X-rays are shielded by a shutter, uh, there is nothing going through the system as it, uh, as it stands. I have uh, put onto the graphic a red circle, simply to indicate that the um, X-ray source and the detector 
are organized to move in a circular trajectory when the uh, system is being measured. And the angle, uh, the, the horizontal angle that is made between the rest position that you can see now and the measurement position as it steps forward and upwards is this magical angle theta, which appears in the Bragg equation, which we started off uh, at the beginning. Um, now, the, the, the point about this is that um, by illuminating all possible diffraction angles, we will learn about all of the layer spacings for the materials which uh, are being examined. You will be, of course, aware that if you have a regular sort of uh, array of dots or lines on a sheet of, you know, sort of squared maths paper, you can actually construct a number of planes which run through the vertices or through the dots, um, which have a absolutely regular uh, description. Um, and they are known as the HKL series, and they describe the indexing of the ways that you can visualize the planes uh, that are running through the, uh, through the sample. So that is the machine. Um, and you can see the samples sitting in their holders. What we will show you now uh, is exactly how we uh, prepare our material ready for the diffraction experiment. So um, a lot of this is, is very, very um, hand orientated. You might be horrified um, or surprised to know that um, most of the rocks that uh, come into the building are crushed entirely by hand. Um, most samples relating to the petroleum sector, for example, um, are more or less loose uh, sand, uh, sandstones. Uh, there are, of course, shales, and they are a little bit tougher to get through. Um, we also deal with uh, materials which are coming from the um, construction aggregate center you know, sort of sector. Um, and so we will we'll get granites and uh, dolerites and, and various forms of marine dredged aggregates, anything like that. But the initial step is simply to break the sample down into, a, well, not a powder necessarily, but certainly a, a loose and homogeneous uh, and properly sampled uh, uh, aggregate of uh, mostly the sand grains from sandstone, for example. We don't actually want to break them down too much at this stage. Um, that is done by hand uh, using a uh, absolute standard pestle and mortar, seen here at number one. Uh, number two is the so-called micronization stage. The micronization stage uh, is mechanical, and we use these uh, clever little things which are described in the uh, literature as a rod mill. Um, the white beads that you can see in the gray pot are a uh, zirconium oxide ceramic. They are nice and heavy, they are nice and smooth, and they sit in a regular pattern in the pot, and you can see that there are uh, gaps in between them. So the uh, sample, uh, two grams of it, is introduced into the pot with about three milliliters of water, so that as that pot is agitated violently by the, uh, the machine, uh, which is basically an electric motor with an eccentric weight, and it just throbs and rattles and bangs those uh, ceramic beads around, which rapidly become coated with a, uh, a slurry of the, uh, the material being ground uh, continually to smaller dimensions. And we will do that for about 10 minutes. And at the end of those 10 minutes, the theory goes that we have a powder which is comprised of a, a series of um, neat particles, approximately 10 microns uh, in, in size. Um, and particularly important that they they are monomineralic. They are not composite grains any longer. So each grain is of a, a separate mineral species, the aggregate of which makes up the uh, original sample in its proper proportion. 
And we can take that um, uh, moist slurry, mix it with a little bit of water quickly just to uh, loosen it up, tip it out of the pot, and then it can either be simply dried in, a, uh, in an oven at uh, 80 degrees uh, Celsius, nothing too hot because that could be damaging to the material. Um, or in fact, we, we have a very, very clever uh, way of treating it for real science purposes, uh, which is called spray drying. So there the slurry is actually introduced into an oven um, where the uh, water carrier is simply flashed off and the dried drops of uh, material rain down inside the oven onto a collecting sheet of paper um, and it can then be tipped uh, into the sample holder. The particularly important point about this is that it is critically important that you do not um, orientate any samples which are non-spherical. Um, I think uh, that you will appreciate that mica, for example, um, with its uh, flattened uh, cleavage um, and, and uh, leaf-like morphology um, is a very, very difficult material because if you apply the slightest pressure to it, it will simply lie flat. Um, and that is a very, very bad situation because you will then make much, much stronger in a statistical sense, the reflections from that particular orientation of the mica. Um, and that is very, very bad news. So everything to do with mounting the sample uh, is designed to, to make the um, resulting powder mount both as dense um, and homogeneous as possible, but without actually introducing into it the preferred orientation of minerals like mica and feldspars or calcite, for example, which have a very, very uh, a perfect rhombohedral cleavage. Um, the way that we do it is to actually chop onto the sample with a, uh, a razor blade, um, and that is able to compact it without actually introducing orientation into the system. Um, and the output uh, from this scanning process is this rather scary looking mess of peaks uh, which you can see in either of the two graphics, which are representing the, uh, the view that we see of the software which we use for um, examining the output. Okay. So if we simply pick apart the, the, the graphic on the, the right hand side here, there is an intensity axis which is vertical and there is the angular axis on the bottom horizontal, which is the, the magical theta value which we found in our, uh, in our Bragg equation. And so there are uh, on the screen um, rocks which are made up of probably only two or three different mineral species, which have been highlighted in fact on the screen, but it's difficult to see um, with green, blue or red lines. Um, and they are almost certainly the, the set of uh, lines which are produced by, for example, um, quartz, calcite, dolomite, yeah, something, something nice and simple for the, uh, for the sake of this, um, uh, this exercise. Um, and in the broadest sense, the uh, intensity of the reflection at a particular angle is a function, not necessarily proportional, but it is a function of the abundance of that mineral within the mixture. The the fact that the minerals are actually producing um, numerous lines makes it rather uh, rather like your regular your regular fingerprint. Um, in order to uh, identify uh, a particular mineral, you need to consider at least three of its uh, principal reflections in order that you're sim not simply misled by. Uh, the coincidence of one layer spacing within the total crystal structure. Um, we are able to call upon uh, automatic finding aids. Um, we've given a, a statistic here that we are able to get hold of the uh, description as a set of lines for approximately 46,000 uh, mineral structures. I mean, um, it is staggering when you look at the number of um, bona fide mineral species, which are uh, thoroughly understood today. And of course, 
the recognition of some of the more obscure ones uh, is based almost entirely upon um, X-ray diffraction because studying their pure crystallography uh, is uh, necessarily um, ambiguous in many cases, or perhaps you only have uh, minutely small amounts of this material uh, to examine. Um, there are also additional databases which deal with other crystalline materials, such as um, um, proteins, um, pharmaceutical materials, you know, all of those. You know, we could uh, probably operate our lab to advantage if what we were doing was looking at the materials which are used to cut recreational hallucinogenic drugs, for example. Um, it is not our business and I'm not going to go there. Um, but we have a, a couple of methods of uh, dealing with the problem of how much of a particular mineral is in a, a particular mixture um, by one of two routes. One of them is simply to measure the intensity of the um, defining peaks for the particular minerals which we have identified within our mixture um, and combine them um, in a spreadsheet basically with information about the intensity of the uh, reflections which are measured from pure materials and from mixtures which are made up specially for the purposes of, uh, of measurement. There is another uh, way of dealing with this. Um, there is on the, the screen the rather curious word here, which is uh, Rietveld. Now, the Rietveld method was invented by a, a gentleman of that name. Um, what we're talking about here is the, the idea that if you are um, sufficiently informed about the structure of a particular crystal, then you can actually predict how it will diffract x-rays and in fact a lot of work on powder diffraction is done in order to refine the understanding of the structure of minerals so you could actually use the whole thing uh, in a in an upside down kind of way to say that um, if you have a particular diffractogram that is the, uh, the, the the pattern of peaks with their varying intensities on the diagram <coughs> that diffractogram is a composite of the output from the diffraction of each of those uh, pure materials. Um, and if you are able to match the intensity um, that is measured from the mixture, then one of the things which must be known as an output is the abundance of those materials within that mixture. So that is the quantification of the uh, of the mixture which you have uh, uh, been measuring um, and it will tell you how much quartz or clay there is in your limestone how much gypsum there is in your mixture for making plasterboard for example or whatever else and it does have specific advantages um, not least because in order to um, properly quantify um, the uh, mineral abundances in, in real rocks, um, you have to do a great deal of measurement of standard materials, which are pure samples of the minerals which are going to be combined in your models for analysis. Um, and basically, if, as uh, has happened to me, somebody comes along with a, uh, a sample which contains minerals which uh, we have not measured previously, then we have a big problem to understand exactly what intensity ratio we should uh, apply to cope with the fact that it has a variable abundance, but simultaneously a variable response to the uh, stimulating X-ray beam. So that table is probably illegible to you. The fact that it is large and unintelligible uh, is enough to say that it is not necessarily the favored method of um, doing the analysis. Uh, this uh, slide is just showing you how we have a real material um, whose response is the blue trace, which you can see there. Um, the uh, background, as it is known, uh, is subtracted. That is the reddish colored line, which you can see running along underneath here. Um, and the computer has actually taken 
the set of minerals which we have divined to be present, which are you know, calcite, dolomite, pyrite, quartz, kaolinite, pyrite. Um, it has combined those diffractograms in order to make a composite. And this, this picture at the bottom shows you the difference between the computed picture and the original measured picture and the, uh, the residual signal, the, 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 um, the difference between those two is a measure of the accuracy of your determination. And my colleague uh, Lorenza, who put this slide together, is very, very proud of the fact that this representative material uh, has a residual which is as low as 3%, which is telling you that it is extremely good work. And we will come on to, um, uh, towards the end, a discussion of exactly um, what can go wrong and, and how we can actually uh, improve the performance of our laboratory uh, to uh, put a brave face to the world. Now, the uh, properties of so many rocks and of those which are of importance to the petroleum sector um, uh, are, are clay minerals. Uh, you know, it cannot be, the clay minerals cannot be understated because they define the uh, porosity and the permeability. Hmm. Excuse me while I have a slurp. Yeah, they, they define porosity and permeability of the rock mass and obviously, therefore, the um, producibility of the uh, hydrocarbon resource uh, which it contains. Um, it's not the only place where the um, makeup and uh, uh, state of the, the clay minerals of uh, geological materials is important, um, but suffice to say that it is of sufficient importance that it is well worth getting the clay out of the bulk sample and studying it separate. And the particular reason for doing that is that, um, first of all, the clay fraction in many rocks is not the most abundant part of the rock. Um, secondly, that its response to X-ray diffraction is not as strong as, for example, the quartz and feldspar matrix of a, uh, an arcosic sandstone. Um, so you want to pull it out of that, uh, that theater of operations and deal with it separately so far as possible, because then you are able to look in the best detail at its uh, properties um, and behaviors. <clears throat> Clay minerals also have a particular um, interesting morphology because they are phyllosilicates. They have a very layered structure um, and a tendency always to settle uh, rather like leaves in a bucket of water that will pack down into a, a, a flattened aggregate. Um, and by doing that, you are actually orientating them. I know I said earlier on, orientation is bad when you're looking at the whole rock, but when you are studying the clays, it is of critical importance because one of the particular ways that you describe clay uh, mineral species is by their layer spacing. So for example, you would say that um, an, an elytic clay had a 10, 10 angstrom layer spacing, or your chlorite was 14 angstrom or whatever. Um, and so by collapsing the structure so that it becomes essentially two dimensional, you are able to learn more about it very, very easily. So this is done uh, by taking a split of our disaggregated material uh, from the, uh, the first uh, preparation steps, which I illustrated. We suspend the clay in water. We subject it to ultrasound so that the sample is broken down into the, uh, the, the, the best um, size fraction. Um, and uh, the clay stacks are broken down so far as possible so that you are looking at very, very neat small domains, which are essentially identical. That uh, <clears throat> suspension uh, is centrifuge, which rejects all of the coarse uh, clastic material within your sample. And what you are left with after a mere five minutes or so at um, puny, 1000 RPM is a suspension of the so-called two micron fraction of the rock. 
and two mic microns, depending on your um, uh, particular orientation, um, is the definition of what makes a clay material. And of course, this pipe two micron dimension is determined by the Stokes equation for the settling of uniform media. Um, it's more complicated than that because they aren't really two microns, but they are the equivalent given that, as I said earlier, these are flattened morphology particles which will settle much slower. Um, those um, materials are deposited onto a glass microfiber filter. Glass is very, very interesting stuff. Because, of course, uh, those of you who are truly savvy will know that glass is not a crystalline material. It is a solid, but it in fact is, is a liquid. And the definition of a liquid is something which does not have a repeating structure, um, which makes the, the fiber, you know, the glass fiber material itself um, invisible to the uh, X ray measurement experiment. So we take one of these circular filters, we chop out a little square and put it onto the uh, aluminium sample holder for one of the older machines. And there is an absolutely standard um, process for the qualitative analysis of clay materials. They go through a series of scans and treatments to sort out from the, the great spectrum of clays exactly what is going on in the sample. So first of all, we will simply air dry the sample that will give us um, scan number one. It is then um, kept in a um, chamber at 60 degrees and exposed to ethylene glycol vapor. The ethylene glycol vapor will enter the uh, layer structure of certain types of clay and they will displace the water layers, which are a structural part of the clay. It's not abs adsorbed water on the surface of the molecules or, or crystals. This is structural water, but it is displaced by the ethylene glycol. And the large molecules actually cause the layer spacing of the clay to increase. Now, that is important because the layer spacing is the D in our Bragg equation. Um, and you can see that there is a change in the diffraction pattern which attends the, uh, the um, saturation with glycol. You can see that the, these peaks here uh, have resolved into a single peak here, and a totally new one uh, has appeared at this location. Okay. So the fact that this has reacted in this way is a diagnostic. We then take this poor glass fiber microfilter, stick it in our furnace at 380 degrees. Um, opinion varies about whether you should use 400 degrees or 380. We are adherents to 380 degrees. And that temperature is sufficient to expel all of the ethylene glycol from um, the susceptible layered uh, clay minerals um, and indeed any water which was lying around um, at the same time. And you can see that between stages two and three, these peaks here uh, have changed significantly. The, the low angle peak, which is here at around five degrees, has disappeared completely. And this peak has become much wider um, and more powerful looking. Um, there are other changes as well. You can see these peaks here have, uh, have changed their shape quite significantly as well. Um, but then finally, we will um, give this uh, poor filter after its third scan another heat treatment where we will elevate the temperature to 550 degrees. So where the uh, glycolation is designed to uh, show the behaviors which belong to the smectite class of clay minerals. The last step is designed to shake out the kaolinite from the mixture, because you might be aware that if kaolinite is heated to 550 degrees, it becomes amorphous. 
uh, it is a so-called metakaolin, um, and these products are actually used in industry um, uh, specifically for their uh, very useful properties after this um, uh, this treatment. So we can now define a series of uh, behaviors and responses which enable us to visualize whether our sample uh, contains smectites. There is the essentially unaffected illite. There is kaolinite, which has become invisible after heating. And chlorite is a bit more tricky, but it is seriously damaged by 550 degree treatment. So by actually overlaying those clay traces, you can quite quickly uh, work out the um, qualitative analysis of your clay mixture and go on from there to look at the intensity of those peaks after each treatment um, and feed that into another Excel spreadsheet which calculates the relative abundance of the clay minerals. We are guided in all these methods by the absolute bible of um, everything to do with clay minerals. Um, Moore and Reynolds uh, are on the umpteenth edition of their textbook nowadays and if you really want to understand clays then that is the book to get hold of. Um, Lorenza has also just popped in here the fact that um, uh, the Clay Minerals Society um, are actually the source of, uh, they are a repository for very, very well characterized samples of clay minerals for experimental purposes. So if you really want to understand how smectites work, you can go to them and say, give me some of your reference smectites so that you can actually check that the experiments that you are performing um, give the outcomes which are expected. And of course, they use the X-ray process, XRD process, to uh, check the purity of their materials and the, the behaviors which are expected by their pure standards are, um, are absolutely correct and predictable. Um, now, I said I wasn't going to give you equations. So I, this, this is the sort of thing that I tend to look at every day. Um, it is actually a stacked up uh, set of diffraction experiments in different colors. You can see Lorenzo has labeled these here. He has put the UT, the air dried or untreated um, uh, sample uh, on, the, on the diagram in red. You can see there, going through this, it has a big peak at this area here. After glycolation, that big peak has moved. It has gone right down there. It has moved to the left and reduced in intensity. You can also see that new peaks have appeared here. Those new peaks are um, composites of the spacing between smectite and illite. And the distance between them is predictable and it is actually telling you the relative abundance of illite and smectite layers in your composite stacks of materials. You can see that both of those peaks have disappeared with the uh, um, uh, heat treatment. The picture is displayed in the green color. And then finally, uh, Shay has given us a rather um, indistinct um, cerise mauve color for the result after heat treatment. And there you can see that this peak here, which was so far essentially unchanged by the uh, various treatments, has now disappeared completely. So we can now label the unique peaks of the, of the diagram um, very specifically. We can say that there is a small peak here, which is due to chlorite. There is a peak here, which is due to kaolinite. There is a discrete illite here, and there is an illite smectite mixed layer uh, material there. Now, it's entirely possible that you have not come across the idea of mixed layer um, clay minerals previously. Um, I certainly hadn't before I uh, started work at X-ray Mineral Services all those years ago, um, but in fact, they are extremely important. And whilst everybody talks about smectite or illite, in fact, hybrids between them are actually quite common. Um, and the result of our experiment here is that we have characterized this material to say that the interstratified mixed layer material has a 
illite content of between 10 and 30 percent. We cannot be more specific than that because in experimental inaccuracies, if you like, um, are such that you can't be more specific. Um, and a great deal of the smectitic material in um, engineering soil, for example, are actually uh, hybrids of this type and understanding them is, is really quite important. So we can do other little tricks as well. I don't want to spend this, uh, too long on this. Um, if you had a shock uh, learning about mixed layer uh, clay minerals, um, there is also the issue that chlorite, which is um, some people would argue it is not actually a clay mineral at all, um, but it certainly reports in the clay fraction. Um, the uh, chlorite picture is quite simple. It has a rational series of um, its HKL reflections. You can see if you can read these numbers off the screen, that this is the 001 reflection. There is 002, 003, 004. So you can see the way that our indexing in the crystal lattice is only dealing with the, the Z or L axis and that each of these reflections in turn is just looking at a thicker chunk of the uh, of the crystal in one go. And if you uh, take the relative intensities of those peaks and combine them, it will actually tell you what is the uh, iron occupancy of the uh, octahedral sites which exist within the uh, uh, within the crystal. <clears throat> so you can say that it is a magnesium rich or clinochlor or an iron rich or chamosite uh, chloride, for example. And people like to know those things because in fact, the response of the different chlorides is quite different um, to stimulus in, in petroleum production, for example, or in weathering. And, and it can be indicative of diagenesis in the, in the sample as well. Um, those who are particularly interested in the petroleum fields are always interested in the, uh, in the kaolinite, which may be present in the sample, because the, um, the crystallinity of the kaolinite is a very, very good indicator of the thermal history of your oil reservoir. So um, you might be able to see if you look closely that we have a series of um, broadly similar uh, traces which are measured uh, from different samples and have simply been stacked up for presentation. The lowest in blue um, has a rather subdued uh, intensity and a rather rounded sort of peak, um, particularly in this area here, um, and that is characteristic of a poorly crystalline material. It, it, when I say poorly crystalline, it means that the domains which are uh, regular are small um, and that there are dislocations within the, uh, the, the crystalline structure um, which cause a sort of spreading out, if you like, of the, uh, of the um, diffracted x-rays during the experiment. There is a moderately crystalline material here where you can see that that ski slope from the first sample is resolving into peaks. And in the final red example, you can see that it has become positively sort of Alpine or Himalayan with a whole series of very, very um, clear peaks, um, which are um, indicative of a well crystallized sample. Now, in fact, you can go a stage further. Um, these are what are referred to as polytypes. Um, kaolinite has another polytype. It is called dikite. Um, the type locality for dikite, I'm pleased to say, is on the Isle of Anglesey, not far away from where I'm giving this talk. Um, and the peaks in dikite are not only um, extremely high in this region, but they are also displaced to higher angle. Um, and if you tell the uh, sedimentary petrologists that they have dikite in their sample in their North Sea oil reservoirs, they get really excited and are really pleased to hear from us. So, uh, so that um, for now uh, is all that I'm going to, uh, to, to say about the method of um, X-ray diffraction. Okay, now I hope you're all still following me. One of the big problems of giving the, uh, the talk in this way is I don't get feedback from the audience the same way. I can't see how many of you have gone to sleep, for example, um, or indeed how many are still listening. So um, I'm going to have a quick slurp, and then we will talk about X-ray fluorescence, which is a different application for 
uh, x-rays, although they are produced um, in exactly the same way. Thank you. <clears throat> so, as before, we start off with our hand crushed sample. But there are a, a couple of things you need to do um, for the major elements uh, analysis. One of them is to um, calcine or ignite the sample. So the uh, material is put into a wave crucible um, and ignited at uh, approximately 1100 degrees for two hours. And then the sample is cooled and weighed and the loss on ignition as it is termed is the combined weight of water, which was in the sample, of uh, CO2, of maybe organic carbon, and, and all of those sorts of things which are um, not easily determined, determined and are not uh, <coughs> heavier metals. The sample is then um, uh, mixed uh, in weighed um, mixture, uh, typically at a dilution of about 10% uh, um, in a uh, borate um, uh, fluxing material. And um, using this, uh, we, we have that you, you can do it with a Bunsen burner if you've got a powerful Bunsen burner and a good pair of tongs. Um, we have a rather clever machine that is called the Vulcan. Um, and it is actually a uh, computer controlled um, gas burner system which produces an extremely uh, high heat. Um, so the materials are weighed out into a platinum crucible. They are put onto the machine. The gas is turned on. I mean, I would love to be able to show you a, a video of this thing working. It's, it's, it's great fun. Um, so the flame uh, heats the crucible from underneath. An electric motor agitates the crucibles to make sure that the contents are well mixed. And after about uh, 15 minutes of uh, roaring gas flame, the uh, preheated molds are then uh, filled by simply lifting the whole row of crucibles, uh, which you can see glowing away merrily at the back of the machine, and tipping them out over the, the weighted uh, moulds which are waiting here and are also at a nice bright red heat. And of course the thing that goes wrong is if somebody forgets to put a crucible down there because then the molten contents of the, uh, sorry a mould, the molten contents of the crucible is then tipped into the gas burner and uh, you have a big clearing up job to do. Great shame. So when that uh, beautiful piece of uh, borosilicate glass, I actually keep one here on my desk for no good reason. There is one, it's just glass disc, more or less colored depending on, on its um, um, uh, content, particularly iron of course, or uh, manganese. Um, that glass disc is then put onto the uh, spectrometer and the uh, bottom of the sample, which is perfectly flat where it was molded, is illuminated by, wait for it, monochromatic x-rays um, and the sample um, is analysed by measuring using diffraction, for goodness sake, um, of the characteristic colours of secondary x-rays that are produced within the sample. Now, this is a very, very old technique. I'm quite sure that many of you are familiar with the use of x-ray fluorescence for analyzing uh, rock materials. Um, and the process for um, measuring trace elements in samples is basically uh, the same. The powdered material is, first of all, milled to make a very, very fine powder. Um, and then it is pressed to make a pellet. The uh, reason why you would do that is because, as I think I said uh, before, when you are making the fused disc, you are actually diluting the sample. And if what you are measuring is a minor or trace element in the sample, then you really want to uh, keep the abundance of the um, elements which you're trying to measure um, as high as possible. And so that pressed pellet is then put onto the uh, spectrometer. And the output of this process is exactly one of those fabulous tables of uh, chemical analysis, which you hated as geology students, and which I'm not gonna dwell on in the slightest, except to show you that you can do lots of analyses for lots of elements and answer lots of questions. One of the questions that you can answer if you are um, 
doing the major elements analysis is to find out whether or not your guess by uh, X-ray diffraction of the uh, mineral analysis of your sample is anywhere near correct. Because you can look up in a book um, like Dear Howie and Zussman, the chemical analysis of a particular mineral, whether it is kaolinite or chloride or quartz or feldspar, dolomite, calcite, the ideal chemical analysis is given within the bulk of the, uh, of the table here. You can see that it is analyzed for principal components like sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, potassium, calcium, manganese, titanium, and iron. And in the same way that those elements actually define most of the commonly occurring uh, rocks in, uh, in surface uh, materials on the earth. So the uh, chemical analysis of the individual minerals, sorry, the, the makeup of the analysis from the individual minerals which are selected is also more or less sufficient to deal with most materials that turn up. Um, it's a surprisingly limited set of minerals and chemicals that you need to define most of the, uh, of the rocks at the surface of the earth. So if you then combine in proportion the analysis of each of your minerals according to the abundance which you've determined, you end up here with a simulated or calculated chemical analysis which you can compare then with the one which is given in the green box, which is the one that we have measured from our X-ray fluorescence analysis. And Lorenza is very, very pleased with the fit of those two. And it implies that you have got something right in all of your experiments. And of course, one of the things that might let you down is if good old dear Howie and Zussman do not have an analysis for the particular mineral which you're interested in. But there are always ways around it. And so you can actually adopt what you might call a circular or holistic approach by using both. Um, I've called this the modal synthesis of mineral content. Um, we haven't come up with a better name for it yet, but uh, don't worry about it too much. I'll explain why it matters again later. So we now need to, to talk uh, a little bit about you know, the applications um, which are uh, suitable and valuable, uh, you know, which can benefit from um, the X-ray diffraction process. Now, it has been widely um, utilized uh, within the petroleum exploration sector for a very, very long time. Um, although you can imagine that the majority of materials are withdrawn from oil wells as beautiful sections of core, which can be poured over in repositories the world around, in fact, of course, the great majority of what comes out of an oil well is simply a uh, rather nasty mess of rock chippings, which has to be separated out and uh, uh, retained for either disposal or archiving, depending on the uh, particular view of the person who's drilling the well. Um, and what I've done here is put together a stack of um, uh, real life samples that do come from sequential sections of an oil well. Um, we have labeled the peaks so that we can actually say with some confidence that, for example, this red uh, trace at the bottom has an abundance of, of a interlayered elite smectite material. So that is not good reservoir um, sort of material because it has uh, a sticky kind of consist which is not going to react well to the production of uh, hydrocarbons because as water enters the system, the smeg pipe will swell up, um, uh, having absorbed the water and uh, shut off the, the flow through the um, uh, permeability of the, of the reservoir. Other uh, traces in this stack uh, show bigger peaks in different areas. So for example, this uh, mauve thing here is fascinating because that is showing a superabundance of chloride. Now, all of these things have you know, different meanings to uh, to different specialists in the petrology of petroleum um, uh, materials and, and uh, exploration. I'm not 
an expert, uh, expert in, in petroleum uh, geology at all, but I do know uh, what, what makes it all tick. Um, and you can see here the presence of cementing materials such as calcite and dolomite, uh, which will not please everybody. But this is the kind of information that can be gleaned um, from the system um, and will enable you to actually characterize the formations which are sequentially drilled by your uh, um, uh, drill string as it uh, penetrates towards the, uh, the target reservoir. I'm hoping that uh, some of you at least will be um, in the geotechnical arena. Um, it is an area which is uh, of great importance in the, uh, in the world today. Um, and it is, uh, in my view, and you could argue this is a straightforward marketing uh, spiel, in my view, not enough uh, effort is put into fully understanding uh, the materials and, and soils which are involved in, in you know, near surface constructions. Um, what I have done here is to put together two traces, which are again, absolutely real life uh, samples um, they are part of the uh, foundation clay survey um, uh, conducted uh, as part of the uh, HS2 um, uh, rail link. Um, they are almost certainly of the London clay. I'm not going to tell you any, any more about it. Um, but the trace tells you immediately that there are two different uh, clay formations uh, in this, the, these adjacent samples. The, the red one at the bottom is dominated by uh, kaolinite. There is a peak there. I mean, I do this for my day job. I can look at and read these diffractograms. So you'd have to excuse me for being very familiar and, and pointing quickly with my mouse at this, but it, but it is the way it is. There is kaolinite there. Um, there, is, uh, there is the second peak. Uh, for kaolinite, so probably chlorite as well. There is illite, but what is critical is the breadth of this area. If you like, there is a huge sort of range of mountains which is sitting between about four and a half and 10 degrees of the trace. And that is because the majority of this clay sample is actually a smectite of some sort. Um, it also, um, contains, if I get my uh, angle right here, this oh, piece I need here. I need strawberries. Got blueberries and raspberry. And there's more. So the, um, uh, the, the peak which I'm pointing at here is actually called pyrite, and you can see that it has no analog in the upper trace at all. So there's a, a difference in the formation. Um, so this, this smectite area is, is not the best news because obviously in, in the uh, geotechnical sector, swelling clays are um, to be avoided where possible because of their behavior after uh, excavation and the, the um, ingress of water into the system, which is occasioned by the uh, uh, construction which has taken place. The upper uh, trace um, similarly has exactly the same kind of uh, shaped peaks here for uh, kaolinite and or chlorite, but you can see that generally it is um, rather sharper and better formed. Um, and this peak critically is very sharp. So that is an example of a, an illite which has no smectite interlayering. So it is neither a mixed layer illite smectite, nor is there significant smectite present in that area. Um, more interesting perhaps too, not only does it not have pyrite, but here is a peak for dolomite and there is a peak for calcite. So you can see that these two adjacent beds of the, uh, the subsurface um, are quite different in their, in their characteristics. And of course, within the context of the London clay, it's well known that the smectitic layers are actually a consequence of the weathering in situ of um, uh, basaltic tufts, which have drifted all the way from the Hebridean uh, volcanic province during the, uh, uh, during the Eocene sort of time. So um, much more interesting than it might seem um, at first sight. Um, I've also been persuaded to include this ghastly diagram because um, we uh, showed you some while ago um, uh, a great table of um, 
chemical analyses. Um, and they are the sort of thing that uh, emerge from the studies of um, quarries where uh, the landowner is looking to uh, predict the uh, forward life of his quarry. That is to say, what he's going to encounter as the uh, excavation actually sort of proceeds. And so this is part of a, a so-called chemostratigraphic model of, of the ground, uh, which has been defined, if you like, in terms of a series of facies, which are defined by the ratio of the chemical elements rather than by uh, description in terms of uh, somebody going out with a hand lens or making a petrographic examination of the rock in order to determine its makeup uh, and its um, uh, propensity. So the uh, data has been used to define a whole series of, of uh, individual units, which almost certainly correspond with beds in the ground in, in the real geological model. Um, and they have also actually used that to grade the material. This is probably um, a series of um, limestones for uh, cement manufacturing. So the, the limestone resource has been graded. There is a column of quality. So green is good stuff. Red is uh, to be avoided at all costs. And um, this enables uh, the estate uh, managers to, to work out the best way of developing their cut. And to see that, for example, there is uh, a lot of the uh, section uh, unavailable to them in certain areas, um, but they can follow the good stuff uh, across the surface up to a point. And there is a lot of synthetic data here, which has been made uh, purely on the basis of the association um, of the chemistry with a, a particular rock type. Now you can argue about chemostratigraphy and whether or not it is valid, but chemostrat company, whose name gives away the main story, um, have obviously been very, very good, very successful at it in the petroleum sector and are looking at uh, extending it into um, quarrying and uh, extractive industries where, of course, clays are an important uh, material. Now, we're gonna have another slurp here. The um, picture on the, the left is um, uh, a rock which, given your location, you might well know. Um, uh, quarries in the Mercia mudstone uh, produce um, gypsum, uh, anhydrite, marls um, and materials for various purposes, but of course uh, one of them is, uh, is brick making. Another famous uh, clay formation of the, uh, the Midlands uh, is the Etruria marl, so-called. It is not, of course, a marl. Mostly it has a very, very low carbonate content, so it's a uh, strange and historical misnomer. Um, if you are in the business of manufacturing bricks and tiles, then you really want to know uh, about the uh, properties of the uh, layers in your, in your um, quarry. Um, now, we've done a great deal of work uh, on um, he heavy clays for brick and tile manufacturing. Uh, it is my personal speciality because when I joined the company, it was uh, uh, essentially a market that was unknown. Um, the company existed more or less entirely in the uh, petroleum sector. And so to avoid that specialization and the risk which attends being shackled to an industry which has dreadful cyclic uh, um, downturns, um, we, we reasoned that our expertise in, in clays um, were of wider application. And we talk now to um, the largest uh, brick making and tile making combines in, in, the, in the world of, uh, of construction. Um, and I see clay come to my desk from as far apart as Texas and Thailand uh, as these multinationals uh, have laboratories within Europe which are their technology centers and use us uh, for their work. So um, I have uh, given you here an absolutely genuine uh, comment which is actually cut and pasted straight out of an email. Um, you've probably read it but I'm just going to say it again in English. Um, the customer commented that he was unaware, or sorry, he was aware that increasing calcium content 
gave a buff fire in colour, but was not aware that patches of our clay contained so much dolomite. And the answer was up to 50%. The trouble is, he says, they all look alike to the man on the digger in the quarry. And that's the point. Um, we and our techniques can help uh, customers in ensuring that what they are digging is of the uh, right quality and that when they build their stockpiles, it actually has the, uh, the, the desired quality for, for their production. So I've given a couple of pie charts here for um, the clay mineral abundance of uh, two famous formations which are used for brick and tile manufacturing. It was the Mercia mudstone that uh, the customer commented on. Um, and you can see that it is a very, very difficult uh, difference material uh, compared to the Etruria marl. The Etruria marl has uh, traditionally made the best uh, bricks and tiles uh, in Britain. Um, and you can see um, the blue sector of pie chart, uh, its kaolinite content is well over 50%. It also contains a certain amount of illite smectite, but in fact, it is uh, mostly elitic. There's not a high smectite content. There is illite and there is uh, chlorite. So it is a fairly benign mix um, and uh, one that is widely used for very, very high quality wares. And of course, you know, even in, even in, in Wales, there is outcrop of the uh, Literaria Marl um, and was the uh, reason for the uh, excellent industry in terracotta wares, um, which is sadly now defunct. The Mercia mudstone, on the other hand, um, it has a lot of um, uh, illite. You can see that uh, something like 70% of the Mercia mudstone from this particular uh, outcrop is uh, illite. Um, and illite plus illite smectite is, you know, approaching, uh, you know, 85% of the sample. Um, there is some chlorite and the rest of it is um, uh, dolomite and, and quartz. So very, very different materials. Both make good bricks, but you wouldn't, for example, want to start trying to make terracotta wares with the Mercia mudstone. And the reason why smectites are rather bad news for people that are in, uh, in brick and tile manufacturing is because um, smectitic materials are very, very difficult to dry. And even when they are dry, there is a very, very strong possibility that they will explode when they go into the kiln because the water uh, is bottled up inside of them. So um, uh, extractive industries um, are definitely somewhere that can benefit from understanding of, of, of materials. We're also active in, um, uh, in the mining sector. Um, at the simple level, um, there is you know, the issue of identifying uh, the mineral species which are of value and which are being produced from the, uh, from the, uh, the mines or, or extraction sites. Um, and obviously this diagram is about the fact that we can recognize these individual species. And of course, it is a surprise sometimes to, to people to learn that if you would take petrography, for example, where dolomite and calcite are very, very similar in their optical properties and actually quite difficult to cut apart, uh, in x-ray diffraction, um, they are not. Um, and they are very, very distinctive uh, minerals which cannot easily or, or cannot be mistaken, although there are problems of overlaps sometimes which make the interpretation process a little bit more difficult because of interference from other minerals, not necessarily other carbonates. And this particular picture actually illustrates um, three carbonates. There is calcite, there's dolomite, there's rhodochrosite, very, very clear peaks. You can see that we're also able to tell apart sphalerite, pyrite, and arsenopyrite, for example, which are not necessarily particularly easy in, in hand specimen. Um, and it, it's surprising that actually, although um, a huge amount of work goes into establishing what the minerality of uh, mining concentrate is, um, that not many companies actually uh, get involved in systematic examination of their uh, their materials by these sorts of methods to uh, to prove that their flotation, for example, is actually producing the mineral that they want. Also within the uh, is extractive arena, but with environmental context, is the idea of um, understanding what you are trying to get rid of. Um, 
the disposal or reprocessing of mine tailings and arising I have uh, labeled this. Um, the, the diffractogram in this particular case you know, um, illustrates a, a material which is uh, disposed of as a consequence of mining for potash or sylvite um, in North Yorkshire. Um, the, the beds are not pure. There is actually quite a lot of work goes into uh, beneficiation of the uh, sylvite ores um, and the waste products which are discharged are mostly gypsum and hydrites and other sort of uh, lithic material, but also um, borates, for example. Um, and we get involved not only in looking at the ores, um, but also in the, the waste stream and even in um, uh, cord samples from the subaqueous nearby um, environment, where we're actually looking at these things accumulating in deposits on the, uh, on the um, present day sea floor. There's also uh, applications within um, architecture and the built environment. Um, for example, um, some of you may know of the, the debacle over the use of a material which is known in Ireland as the kelp, um, dark, um, dirty limestones from the Carboniferous in the Dublin district, Dublin district. During the tiger years of their economic boom, um, a lot of new housing was built in the Dublin district using local sources of um, uh, aggregate or foundation material. It proved to be exceedingly un, un, uh, unhealthy um, and um, very, very serious problems have arisen where the weathering of pyrite in the sample um, has, has resulted in, in ground heave um, and serious structural damage to uh, the properties that are built on top of the, the material. So I've put together a, uh, a picture here of um, what one of these uh, limestones looks like. Um, there is a big peak there for calcite, which goes off the scale. There is a smaller peak there for quartz. So you can see that quartz is quite an abundant part of this material. Um, and there is a peak here, which has been labeled um, for pyrite. So it's a very recognizable uh, material. The only thing that is a shame is that I cannot also show you a picture of one that has a peak down here for gypsum, um, which is produced in situ uh, as a consequence of the reaction of the acid uh, from oxidizing pyrite um, and its reaction with calcium carbonate. Um, we also do work in, in pharmaceutical materials. Um, uh, for example, one of them, uh, it sounds marvelous, synthetic osteogenic composites, um, uh, bone basically. Um, your body constantly recycles all of its calcium and phosphorus. I mean, when it goes wrong, you call that process osteoporosis. But if you want to rebuild bones, what you need to do basically is to fill the damaged area with a putty of uh, made of gypsum and hydroxyl apatite and uh, your, your biochemical uh, processes will take over and recycle all those nutrients and uh, make it as good as new and unrecognizable from the original um, given sufficient time. But the synthesis of uh, hydroxyl appetite is not straightforward um, and the reaction can go in one of two different directions producing um, a tricalcium phosphate called Whitlockite in one direction or hydroxyl appetite in the other direction. And you can never actually produce a pure product, only something which contains around 90% of the, uh, uh, the thing you're actually seeking to produce. So quality control of these materials um, is important. And the only way of knowing what there is there is to look in effect at the crystallography of the product. Because if you were to look at the chemistry, you would find that the chemistry is essentially identical. Uh, for both of the uh, product materials. So regular quality controls in uh, pharmaceutical are um, uh, quite important. Um, there's also another lovely story. Um, everybody nowadays is being uh, persuaded that they need a shiny new electric car with a fabulously um, energy dense um, lithium battery. Um, lithium is a difficult material to, uh, to mine comes from two principal sources. One of them is uh, a mineral called spodumene, which is a pyroxene from pegmatites. Um, and there are evaporite sources, uh, principally in, in South America, um, which are produced as well.
What do you mean is interesting because although it contains about 8% lithium oxide, um, it's very, very difficult to get the lithium out of the spodulene. Um, but somebody quite a long time ago discovered that you can actually uh, heat treat spodumene. Um, and when I say heat treating, um, it's high temperature. You're talking 800 to 1100 degrees C. Um, and if you keep it nice and hot for long enough and then air quench it, it will not invert and it will leave you with the beta or gamma form of the uh, spodumene, um, which are susceptible to uh, leaching by sulfuric acid uh, to produce um, lithium as, a, as an output. And the picture here, and I'm hoping you can see this, um, is of the, uh, a mixture of um, the polymorphs of spodumene. Um, the one which is uh, here, which has pale blue, there, there is a good peak in pale blue. That is for the alpha form. So in this particular mixture, the uh, heat treatment has not resulted in complete inversion. The big green peak here is showing you that the majority of the spodumene in this sample um, has been converted into the um, beta form. Um, and there is a certain amount of the gamma form as well, which is given here by this, this purple line. So rather like the last case, um, if you were to be given a sample of the, of the spodumene and said, here you are, um, analyze that, assuming you were able to analyze the lithium content, which is not simple, then you, know, uh, you would not be able to do it on, on chemical grounds, but crystallography will take you to the answer. Um, and there is the, uh, the diffraction pattern to prove it. Now, exploration goes on in a number of places. One, to me, one of the finest applications of X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence um, is actually trundling around, working hard on the surface of Mars as we are speaking. And uh, of course, in February, further missions with landers will be uh, setting up shop on the surface of Mars to continue the exploration process. Now, the uh, Curiosity rover um, is a very versatile and, and serious beast. This is the size of a small car. Um, it has a plutonium thermoelectric generator, uh, so it has quite a good power supply. Um, doesn't rely on solar panels for uh, its uh, energy um, requirements. Um, and it uh, is able to do some quite good science because it has a power supply strong enough to run an X-ray tube, for example. So within its capabilities, it can actually drill rocks and recover fine powders. It can uh, deploy its scoop to pick up a sample of the regolith, and it can deposit it into the, uh, into the analytical chamber, which is uh, indicated there. Um, it is subjected to a beam of X-rays and the CCD um, device, which uh, measures the uh, output photons from the experiment, uh, is organized in a circle. So again, we're going back to this idea of, of the, the, the measurement of angles along the circle and the Bragg equation. Um, it is able to measure at all angles simultaneously. So it sort of builds up a spectrum. Um, although it is a fairly low powered device and it um, will take it up to 10 hours to, uh, to, to do a complete analysis. Um, but what's clever about this little beast is that it is bo doing both XRD and XRF at the same time, because uh, right back at the beginning, I, I think I made the comment that even though what you're doing when you design your XRD experiment, um, you know, with, with your collimated beam of X-rays, monochromatic coming in, um, they will actually interact with the substrate that is being illuminated um, and they will give off secondary um, X-rays as a consequence of fluorescence. And in fact, within the, the field of the di diffraction that we do, um, that, that fluorescence is a problem because the copper radiation which we use will actually cause iron bearing minerals to fluoresce. And that creates a fuzzy background, which upsets the sensitivity of the uh, system somewhat. And um, so, you know, our clever Curiosity rover is able to do both uh, XRD and XRF on the same sample and come back with 
uh, fabulous data um, on environmental characterization and whether or not we are looking at a legacy of a water-based system and whether ultimately uh, there was the possibility that what we would call life could survive um, at that time. So um, that's really uh, the end of the, uh, the talk. Um, we always put this in at the end. Um, I mean, it says, why choose X-ray mineral services? I mean, you are not customers specifically, um, but anybody who goes out into the marketplace to, to sell their uh, services has to be able to show that they are actually a credible organization. Now, um, going back to the Clay Mineral Society, um, Douglas McCarthy is one of the people that organizes what is called a round robin um, quantitative phase analysis um, competition. And uh, a large number of competitors are sent little tubes of sample. They say, here you go, guys, analyze that, tell us the answer, and we will mark your homework. Um, I'll show you how the homework is marked in a minute. But I'm delighted to say that because we are a credible organization, we are well placed uh, in the last three rounds of the competition where we have made a serious attempt at the competition. Um, fourth uh, position for one particularly relevant sample. Um, and for the last couple of rounds of the competition, we have achieved eighth and ninth position, which is fabulous. Um, the reason why the shale is, is relevant is because, curiously enough, one of the samples that was sent to us this year was a sample of uh, a synthetic Martian regolith. Not everybody regards that as a, uh, a sensible analytical target, but uh, who cares? Um, this is how the homework is marked. Um, the sample is analysed, you report your results, they calculate for each of the identified phases the error in your uh, answer. So for example, here we had, um, we measured 14.2% of quartz rather than 15.7. So that gives you a variance of 1.5. They add up all the variances and there's your total. And so you can see that there is a spread of variance across the axis of this bar chart here. Some people you can see uh, have a significant variance, others, us included, slightly smaller for this particular sample. So I would like to, uh, to, to finish in effect by saying that we are not only um, uh, anxious to, to spread the word about our services, but quite good at uh, um, performing those services as well. Um, and that um, is the end of my talk. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, my colleague Lorenza who has uh, done the boilerplate for this uh, presentation. Um, I have used pictures without attribution. It is very naughty of me, but they are not used for gain specifically, um, and I am not pretending that they are all my own. Um, but I would like to thank you for listening, if you have been, and for inviting me to present to you. Okay. Many thanks. Many thanks, Jonathan. Very good indeed. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, I'll do that right now. Stop the recording. Yeah.